Not the most skilled, not the most gifted, but the most I am will. Your son of a gun, the guts you displayed, the great will to win, the sacrifice and the discipline. I can recall the first flag you won and the day you made North Sour come, and I can remember the blues coming home. Now once again, the demons are your own. Not the most classy, not the most skilled. Not the most gifted, but the most I am willed. Barras, you're the captain, the one that led us through. Barras, you're the captain, up there amongst the few. Barras, you're the captain of the Hall of Fame. Barras, you're the captain of our great Australian team. Ronald Del Barassi. In football, few names have contributed more to football than football has to them. And in the 150 year plus history of the league, few people have been a bigger name and had a bigger influence on the game of Australian rules football than Ronald Del Barassi. And this reverence is reflected with Barassi the first player to be inaugurated into the Australian Hall of Fame, Football Hall of Fame, as a legend, and he is one of three Australian rules footballers to be elevated to the same status in the Sport Australia Hall of Fame. The legend of Barassi begins in 1937. Born in Castlemaine, he was a third generation Italian Australian, the only child of Ron Barassi Sr. At one year of age, he moved to Melbourne. The next year, so his father could play for the Demons, thus beginning Barassi's lifelong association with the club. At Melbourne, Ron Senior would be a consistent rover. He played 58 games for the Demons, including the 1940 Premiership side. However, this day of glory in 1940 was to be Ron Senior's last game for the club, as he joined the Australian military shortly after and served during World War II in Tobruk where he would tragically lose his life, becoming the first footballer to die in the war. This was to be the first way in which Barassi would change the league forever. Although unintentionally, with Ron Senior's death, a group of players and officials at the Melbourne Football Club pledged to support his widow, Elza, and her son young son. As a teenager, Barassi was determined to follow in his father's footsteps at the Demons. But the zoning system of the day required him to play for either Collingwood or Carlton. And considering the impact Barassi had for the Demons in the 50s, this could have very easily been the difference between, well, Collingwood dominated the league and Melbourne. But because of the zoning system, in place of the time, Barassi could only ever play for one club. He was effectively raised by that club, Melbourne. So Melbourne went to the VFL, and, he su and they successfully lobbied for the creation of a father-son rule, which gave the first preference of recruiting of sons of players who had played a minimum of 50 games to that club. And so when the time came, Melbourne recruited Barassi from Preston Scouts and became only the second player signed under the rule. A rule that continues to exist to this day and has led to many father-son legend combos. Such as the Ablets, Silvanis, Fletchers, Watsons, amongst others. The young Barassi was effectively raised by the Melbourne Football Club, with Barassi taken in by former Melbourne champion and legendary coach Norm Smith at age 16, when Barassi's mother moved to Tasmania. Living in his backyard bungalow, Barassi would debut with Melbourne in 1953 against Footscray, but he was flattened early on. 
Grassi struggled early on in his career, but Smith noticed natural talent and created a whole new role for Ron, the Ruck Rover position, which he excelled in. This position paved the way for a new style of quicker ball movement, which teams across the league adopted en masse. Barassi felt Smith was especially hard on him, but he was harsh but fair. For Barassi, he soon was recognized for his leadership abilities and quickly became one of the league's biggest and best players. As the demons were raising hell in the competition, Barassi became synonymous with the D's dominance. At Melbourne, he played in eight grand finals from 1954 to 1964 including seven consecutive grand finals, including a hat-trick between 1955 and 1957, back-to-back -back flags in 59 and 60, and, well, 64. Barassi was a sensation, and he dominated on the big stage. A, gig, a big games player. For contemporary audiences, Dustin Martin is the biggest name when it comes to finals football, with three Norm Smith medals. But had the Norm Smith medal existed when Norm Smith was coaching, Barassi could have had a claim to four Norm Smiths himself. With the 1959 Grand Final quite possibly his greatest performance, in five minutes of the match he played some sublime football just before half time he dragged Melbourne back into the match. He kicked three goals in quick succession, putting Melbourne into the lead. While in 1957 he would put in one of the most courageous final series ever, having suffered a spate of injuries from chipped finger burns, bruised backs, gashed eyelids, and, and two bruised shoulders. This didn't stop Ron lifting a third Premiership Cup in 57, and in 1960, as captain, well, he lifted the cup as Premiership captain in one of the first grand finals with a cup. While Barassi would claim one last flag with the Demons in 1964, but freely admitted that he played a poor game, and the Demons had lost the match, well, Barassi felt he would be responsible. This was Barassi's final act in the Red and the Blue, was lifting that cup in 64. It's one of the biggest moments in league history, a big bang moment that changed the competition was about to explode. Barassi would swap the Red and the Blue for the Navy Blue. See, back in the 1960s, player movement and trades were very rare and irregular especially with big name players. So when the biggest name of the competition swapped jumpers, well, it shocked the football landscape, and many saw it as an ultimate betrayal. Today it became known that uh, Melbourne champion Ron Barassi is an applicant for the position of playing coach. Where is your heart, Ron? Right here, Mike. There were kids crying, parents ringing up George Harris, asking him, what will all these Melbourne kids with do with their number 31 Guernseys, of which Harris replied, My constant answer was, well, we're going to give him a 31 Guernsey at Carlton. For Carlton's new president, George Harris, well, it was the ultimate coup, but it wasn't easy. Harris hounded Barassi desperately trying to recruit him. Eventually, though, Harris secured his man, offering a credibly lucrative deal of the time, £9,000, and more importantly, the chance to captain coach the club. This is what really convinced Barassi. Barassi was Smith's protege, raised by the Melbourne Football Club, with Smith as a father figure to Ron. The Melbourne, it screamed betrayal, but Smith encouraged Barassi to take the chance to coach. Although Smith did offer to step down as coach for Melbourne in favour of Ron to take charge, Barassi didn't want to push his friend and mentor out. Although a clearance battle would break out towards the end of the year, with Barassi unable to train with the club for some time, he was able to coach eventually, with these issues resolved, and well, the Barassi Blues debuted against Hawthorne in Round 1, 1965. The apprentice Barassi had learnt well from the Master Smith. He brought to Carlton ruthless discipline and commitment. He preached a tough brand of football, and he charged his men to play selfless, team-orientated game styles, and he led by example. He screamed and barked orders at his men, and he transformed Carlton. Having finished in their lowest point ever and their history at that point in 1964, to breaking a 22 season long drought in 1968 against old rival Eston. In 1969, Barassi played his last game, retiring and coaching from the stands instead, but he would lead Carlton to another grand final campaign. For this time, the Blues went down by 25 points, but Barassi was a man who learnt his lessons. 
he remembered the mistakes he made in the 1969 grand final, and this would help contribute to the 1970 campaign in which Barassi's legendary status in coaching was cemented. In 1970, Collingwood and Carlton, the league's two biggest rivals, were the, the league's two best teams, with both teams headed with dominant centurion forwards in the goal square of Peter McKenna and Adelix Jezelinko you beauty. It was clear these were the teams that were going to play in the big one. But come grand final day, it appeared to be all going terribly wrong for Carlton. Well, the old pies were now the hot pies. The old Collingwood machine was on full throttle, leading by 44 points at half time. But Barassi, well, he swung the game at half time, imploring his men to play on and handball at every opportunity. The history says the rest. He revolutionized the way the game is played by turning handball into weapon, and the game swung dramatically. Carlton went on a goal-kicking rampage in the third quarter, kicking seven goals in ten minutes to somehow find themselves in front. Collingwood were not prepared for this onslaught and this method of play, and, well, they capitulated. This move wasn't the only move Barassi made at halftime, as he also brought in a blonde mop bombshell, Teddy Hopkins, who played the game of his life. In 1978, the interchange rule was introduced. One of the reasons for this was due to the increasing use of reserve players being subbed into the game and the increasing speed of the game in the 70s with some teams recording up to 100 hand passes a game and while the VFL was becoming increasingly fast paced, attributed a lot to the methods Barassi employed. And well, the Barassi come as well much is made about his half time address. His third quarter time address is underrated in the 1970 grand final. Barassi went hard at three-quarter time in 1969, but he remembered his lesson. In 1970, he said, Win or lose, I'm proud of you boys. Of which the team responded, Lose? We're not gonna lose. And they didn't. 1970 belonged to the Blues. After 1970 defined Barassi as a coaching legend, Barassi would stay at Carlton for one more year. However, the Blues suffered a hangover that year and they missed the finals, of which Baresi decided to call it a day, saying he was tired from football and he needed a break. In 72, he would stay out of coaching, but the league wasn't about to lose a man like Baresi, as he did some commentary work, media work. But in 73, Baresi was lured to North Melbourne, the struggling ruse. The first big signing from North, and together with administrators Alan Aylett and Ron Joseph, while well, they began recruiting a batch of stars for North Melbourne. Ten years earlier, Barassi did it. It was unthinkable for stars to leave the competition. To come 1973, the ten-year rule had been introduced. With the ten-year rule, North took full advantage, signing some of the league's biggest names, with John Rantel, Doug Wade and Barry Davis while poaching interstate stars in Malcolm Blight and Barry Cable. North were dubbed the Millionaire Club under Barassi's ruse, and under Barassi, while the ruse climbed from being wooden spooters in 1972 to reaching the grand final in 1974. Although convincingly beaten, this was North's first of five consecutive grand finals. Barassi implemented a tough training procedure in 74, but after unleashing hell on his players following the 74 grand final loss, well, he modified their training schedule in 75, with a focus on keeping them mentally focused and not overtrained and exhausted. And 75, well, Barassi's ruse became the last VFL team to win their first premiership convincingly against fellow 1925 entrants into the league, Hawthorne, which the Roos won convincingly. In North Melbourne 75, uh, all the other famous clubs had their go a long while ago at the first. Uh, but I can remember going back to the social club afterwards and uh, um, I'd been pleasured in grand finals myself before and I'd been spoiled in that regard. So I, uh, my greatest pleasure that night was watching the old supporters, you know, 50, 60, and 70 year olds, uh, just dug down the, the pleasure. Oh, that, those people too, but the, uh, <laughs> they, they were just yes, beside sure. themselves and, you know, they, oh, was, they yeah. were saying, you know, if I die now, it doesn't matter, sort yeah. of thing. It was ab absolutely magnificent. In the 70s, Hawthorne and North would have quite a rivalry. 
with the two biggest personalities of the time in Kennedy and Barassi charging their troops. In 76, Barassi was involved in a serious accident that resulted in his spleen being removed, and Barassi having to use a motorized buggy and a wheelchair for a short time. But this doesn't stop Barassi. Despite the setback, he attended training nights at Arden Street, and could be seen directing players with assistance. They would go to, down to the Hawks in 76, but 1977 it was North versus Collingwood, Hafey versus Barassi, a 74 rematch between the two coaches, and in an all-time classic, the Pies had come from last the year before to grand finalists. Barassi made some positional moves, including subbing champion Malcolm Blight out of the match, who was having a terrible day, and moving full-back David Dench into the forward line, which sparked a North comeback. However, Ross Dunn would later kick a goal that would draw the match in the final minutes of the match. However, within a week, Baresi had picked his side up from this disappointing setback to lead North to a memorable triumph. <laughs> Baresi went to their social function that night, while Collingwood didn't. The next week in the replay, it was Baresi's day of glory, claiming his 10th premiership as player and coach. So this was Baresi's last premiership. He would stay at North for another three years, leaving in 1980, which included another grand final appearance in 1978. As a coach for 70s was Barassi at his peak of his powers, both in the public eye and as a coach. In 1980, the Barassi Roos claimed one last piece of medalware, a controversial 1980 Escort Cup grand final, in which he kicked a goal after he had marked a ball after the siren had blared, but, can but it didn't matter. The kangaroos had it. In 1981, after 17 seasons, Baresi returned home to Melbourne. Since Rod had left, the D's had collapsed, stacking Norm Smith sensationally midway through the 1965 season, the year after they won the Premiership. Melbourne had failed to return to the finals. But in 1981, well, Ronald returned to assist, it. and with long term under 19 coach Ray Slug Jordan, they helped raise the levels of standards of the club substantially, with the under-19s making three straight grand finals between 81 and 83, including a premiership in 81 and 83. While Barassi would not reach finals in his time, at Melbourne he helped set the club up. As Barassi himself would say, in the five years we were there, I think we raised the level of the club quite substantially. Melbourne reached the preliminary final two years after we left, and the grand final the year after that. I felt we did some of the groundwork. Perhaps Barassi's most significant contribution in his Melbourne days was the Irish experiment. Ron Barassi, drawing comparisons between Aussie rules and Gaelic football, identified that Gaelic footballers could provide an untapped mine of potential stars. The 80s was a significant time of change for football, with South moving to Sydney in 82 and the increasing national focus and the, as the sport became more and more professional. Victorian clubs were recruiting stars from across the country. So in 1982, Barassi and his recruiting team, with Barry Richardson, travelled to Ireland to identify talent. Their first recruit was Sean Wright, who was widely hailed for his rapid conversion. Though others who joined had much less success, but more significantly, the most significant of these recruits, though, was Jim Steins, who, like Barassi, was to become a man who personified and bled the red and the blue like few others. Steins, described as a tall, skinny lad from Ireland, quickly proved his talent. While he made some costly errors in his early days due to his lack of understanding of the game, such as in the 1987 preliminary final. Ultimately, those Steins adapted and became a star of the league, winning the 1991 Brownlow and paved the way for more Irish footballers, from Tide Canelli. Zach Tui, and to this day, Ireland continues to source star players such as Matt Duffy, a recent recruit. All as a result of Barassi's initial idea to travel to Ireland in the 80s. Barassi seemed done and dusted with coaching after leaving Melbourne. Although he remained a prominent voice in the league, it seemed Barassi's coaching days were behind him. And with a legacy that he had left, he was already a legend. But in 1993, he returned one last time to the coaching gig as the coach of the Sydney Swans. This was seen as a coup for the AFL, given Barassi's media skills and profile. 
Sydney Swans weren't a run in the early to mid 90s, but Sydney experiments seemed to be a failure. But Barassi was able to praise the profile of Australian rules in rugby heartland and was able to set the Swans up for success for his successor, Rodney Eade, who took them to the grand final in the year after Barassi retired, approaching once and for all. Off the field, Barassi continued to make headlines. In 07, he tracked the Kokoda Trail in 08 on New Year's Eve. While Barassi was dining with his friends when, at Southern Cross Station, he noticed a woman being assaulted by a man. Barassi intervened in the situation, charging in like he was the rock rover that he was in his playing days to assist the woman, who had no issue beating up a 72-year-old man and a woman. Real tough guy there. As mentioned, Barassi was to be the inaugural Australian Rules Hall of Famer and named the Team of the Century in 1996. He's been involved in the grassroots development of the game and a large advocate for the development of the game internationally, particularly in South Africa. Reflecting this, Barassi had lent his name to the Barassi International Australian Football Youth Tournament. In 2006, when Melbourne hosted the Commonwealth Games, Barassi was one of the last runners in the Queen's Baton Rally for the 06 Games. His section of the rally involved him taking the baton from a series of pontoons in the middle of the Yarra River onto shore. It was handed to him by David Neitz, the captain of the Melbourne Football Club. This was accomplished by having Barassi walk on a pontoon that was submerged just beneath the surface of the water, giving the impression that he was walking on water. Barassi's name is so synonymous with football that the geographic divide in Australia between rugby and Aussie rules has been dubbed the Barassi Line that intersects the border towns of Korowa and Wangaya, where in 2014, Barassi attended the unveiling of a plaque which commemorated the Barassi landing. While retired from coaching and nowadays mostly out of the public eye, Barassi's legacy raised the status of football in the country, developing the game into the national game it is today, changing the way the game was played, with its revolutionising game plans and tactics, and its high profile media scope. Ronald Del Barassi is perhaps the biggest name football has ever seen and will ever see. Thank you guys, and if you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more.